Sometimes we doubt because we look at ourselves and we, we realize we're not worthy. We have so many discrepancies. We have so many weaknesses. We have so many things that, uh, you know, we think is not pleasing to God. And we conclude that, oh, you know, I'm not worthy of God's blessing. Then God must not bless me. Wrong. God blesses you not because you are worthy. God blesses you because He loves you and you are worth dying for he died for you at the cross and by his death he canceled all the curse all the sicknesses and all the deadly darkness that the enemy has targeted against you he canceled every darkness and you are released and our confidence is on what he did at the cross there you will find miracles there you will find the goodness of God if your trust is on Him and not on your performance, not on your ability, not on your uh, goodness, but on Him. There you find your true identity. There you find your blessing, the presence of God. Now tonight, I have something uh, that I really would love to share and for so long for many years already I have been deeply desiring to share this and I pray that you will have ears to hear I pray that you will have eyes to see tonight uh, what how beautiful the Word of God is how beautiful Jesus is and my prayer is that tonight you will gain a deeper appreciation of scriptures I pray na uh, you will see scriptures like never before and you will be like reading a new Bible. It's like you've never read your Bible before. I pray that you will just fall in love with the beauty of Jesus, who He is. Now, I'm going to be talking about Matthew 24. We've been uh, looking at this chapter and uh, I would like to talk tonight about how to read Matthew 24 properly. And uh, you know what? When we misread and misunderstand scriptures, we cast a shadow of doubt on the words of Jesus. It's kind of like we are, uh, you know, like uh, we are not upholding the integrity of the words of Jesus. If we misread, misunderstand uh, his words. Let me give you an example. You know this guy probably, C.S. Lewis. Um, he died in 1963. You must be familiar. You, have you seen the movies, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia? C.S. Lewis, from his books, he, he wrote a series of books for children, uh, and uh, some, you know, it was made into movies, Chronicles of Narnia. He, C.S. Lewis is one of the most influential philosophers, Christian philosophers of our, of our time. And a verse in Matthew 24, he said, it's the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. <laughs> Can you imagine the most embarrassing verse? He said, Jesus failed to fulfill his prophecy. Look Look what he read. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, what he wrote, I'm going to read to you. The apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proved to be false. You know, the apocalyptic expectations, their belief that Jesus will come again. See, as Lewis said, it has been proven to be false. It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And worse still, they had a reason, one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. So C.S. Lewis was saying, it's so embarrassing because the early Christians believed that the second coming would happen in their lifetime. It's because their master, Jesus, told them so. Very embarrassing because it did not happen. He shared, he's talking about Jesus, and indeed created their delusion. 
He said in so many words, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. <laughs> He's talking about that verse 34, Matthew 24, when Jesus said, Everything I told you so far, it will happen in your lifetime, in your generation. To the ones listening to him. And, you know, he was talking about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And see, as Lord was said, it, that didn't happen. How embarrassing. Jesus failed to fulfill his prophecy. And this is an apologist. This is one of the most brilliant Christian thinkers. And this is what happens when we don't understand how first century rabbis taught and wrote. And I'm going to talk to you again about illusion. It is so important, the principle of illusion. Now, this is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. Matthew 24, verse 30, and then verse 34. See the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. See, that's in verse 30. The Son of Man comes on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then verse 34, Jesus continued to say, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Including this coming of the Son of Man in clouds of heaven with power and glory. He said it was going to happen in that generation. And this is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. It did not happen. Obviously, the disciples were expecting the second coming, but it did not happen in their lifetime. I believe if you go back to chapter 16, verse 27, Look what Jesus said. The Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels. And then He will reward each person according to what they have done. You read that verse and you say, oh, this is the second coming. The Son of Man, He will come in His Father's glory with His angels. So the coming of the Son of Man. Then look at the next verse. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here, will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. You know, after talking about the Son of Man coming with the glory of His Father and the angels, Jesus said, it's going to happen. In your lifetime, you who are listening to me, you are not going to taste death. This is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. He was confused. He said, you know, Obviously, Jesus did not know about the timing of his coming. It did not happen. And his disciples were waiting and expecting it to happen in their lifetime because Jesus told them, you're not going to taste death. You're still going to be alive in your lifetime. It will happen. And many are confused and saying, oh, it did not happen. What, you know? Well, the reason why, I'm sorry, Mr. C.S. Lewis, the reason why one of the most brilliant philosophers was confused, it's because they did not understand the principle of illusion. When Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory, he was alluding to Daniel chapter 7. You see, ancient rabbis they always use illusion. They would quote a verse, but they did not quote like what we do today. Because today, our verses and chapters have numbers. That's actually a recent invention when the printing press was invented. 500 years ago. And, and uh, it was not easy mass producing the Bible and printing the Bible and what they did before each letter would have a block and they would assemble it and they need to organize everything for the job and so they placed numbers for every verse and numbers for every chapter. That's a recent invention. 
And unfortunately, along with the numbering of verses, we come up with this practice where we, we would just quote one verse and, you know, think there's that particular verse by itself has meaning. The ancient Jews did not think that way. When they would quote a verse, they are actually quoting the verses before and the verses after because the message, the, what they're saying, is actually the message is found in the whole prophecy, in the whole uh, proverb, or in the whole vision, or prophecy, or poem, or song. When they allude to something, the message is in that something. So when Jesus quoted a verse from Daniel 7, he was actually alluding to the whole vision of Daniel 7. And if you read Daniel 7, it's not a downward movement of the Son of Man. It's not, it's not the Son of Man coming from heaven to earth. It's actually the Son of Man ascending to his throne on clouds of glory in heaven. So when Jesus said, your generation, you're going to see the Son of Man ascending. Uh, I mean, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He wasn't talking about a second coming. He's talking about a Son of Man coming to his throne. You, you read Daniel 7, that's the message. So it's so important that we understand illusion. Because if we fail to understand we will fail to get the meaning. And, and that's the case with Daniel, with Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we need to understand that Jesus was quoting verses. And when he quotes a verse, we need to go to the source of that verse. Because unless we go to the source of that verse, we will never understand what he was trying to say. Because the meaning of his message is in the alluded prophecy, the alluded vision, the alluded poem, the alluded song. That's where you find the message. So Jesus was alluding to... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus was alluding to Daniel's prophetic vision in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 to 28. And... um. Now look, just to give you an illustration, another example of allusion. You look at uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. A surface reading of these verses, and you will not really see the deeper, greater, more glorious meaning of what Matthew was trying to say. Here in Matthew chapter 2, it, Matthew was talking about Jesus when he was a child. And King Herod was killing the babies in, in Bethlehem because he heard that the Messiah has been born. And so he wanted to kill all the babies in Judea. And, and the angel warned Joseph to escape the slaughter. The angel told him to go to Egypt. And so in verse 14 of Matthew 2, so he got up, that's Joseph, took the child. This is Jesus, the child. Took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. You see here, Matthew, in writing about Jesus, he quoted a verse from Hosea 11. When he was talking about, you know, Joseph and Mary took the child and they went to Egypt. And they stayed in Egypt until... Herod died. So that, that took many years. They stayed in Egypt. And then Matthew, he took a verse from Hosea 11. He said, and so was fulfilled the words of the prophet. He's talking about prophet Hosea. 
out of Egypt I called my son. Now, for many years I've read this and I, I, I was thinking, oh, okay. So Matthew was thinking, Hosea chapter 11 was about Jesus. Okay. No big deal. Hosea 11 verse 1. But oh, if we understand the principle of illusion, that when a rabbi or a biblical writer would quote a verse from a prophecy, he was alluding to the whole prophecy. Because back then, the first century Jews, they were familiar with scriptures. When a rabbi would quote a verse, he assumes that his listeners understood and remember the verses before it and the verses after it. If a person is unfamiliar, then he would not understand. That's how allusions work. For example, if I tell a brother, for example, if I tell Jed here, Jed, don't be a Romeo. It's because he understands the story of Romeo and Juliet. You know, Romeo was a very romantic guy. <laughs> now, if, if somebody listening does not know the Romeo and Juliet story, he would have no idea what, what I was saying to this brother. So who's Romeo? What, what did he mean by that? That's the principle of illusion. The speaker assumes that the listener knows what he was alluding to. Here, Matthew was alluding to Hosea 11. You know, do you know what's in Hosea 11? Can I read to you? Hosea 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. You see, Hosea 11 was about Israel. Israel, the Israel of God, the seed of Abraham, <laughs> the nation of Israel, the covenant nation of Israel. That's what Hosea 11 is all about. If you continue reading, you will see God talking about Hosea, writing about God's affections and God's love for Israel. Just to pick some verses, I will not read the whole ver uh, chapter, but... Look at verse 2 and 3. But the more they were cold, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burnt incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize. It was I who healed them. Ephraim, you know, the prophet Hosea would interchange Israel with Ephraim because Ephraim was the firstborn son. He was the receiver of the birthright. Among the 12 tribes, the one who received the birthright was Joseph. And uh, Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Among the two, it was Ephraim who received the birthright. And so Ephraim carried the name of Joseph because he received the inheritance of his father, Joseph, the one who carried the birthright. And the one who carried the birthright actually represented the whole family. And so Ephraim is synonymous with Israel. Now, here the Lord was saying, I love you. You walk away from me, but I love you. You don't realize how much I love you. And then you look at uh, verse 4. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like the one who lips a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. You see the affection of a father here? God was talking about his love for the nation of Israel. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is changed within me. All oh, my compassion is aroused. You see here the burning love of God for Israel. Now, what's, what's the point? When Matthew wrote about Jesus, he quoted Hosea 11. He's actually saying, this Emmanuel, this baby boy born of the Virgin Mary, this Savior, he is the Israel of God. He is the embodiment of Israel. 
He is the chosen of God. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the favored of God, the blessed of God. That's what the message of Matthew was. When he alluded to Hosea 11, he was talking about the message of Hosea 11. He is actually saying, this one fulfills the words of the prophet. And if you look how, how, at how Matthew wrote about Jesus. Jesus came out of Egypt. And then the next thing you read, he was baptized in the river Jordan. And then after that, you see him led in the, into the desert for 40 days. And then after that, he chose 12 disciples. You see the pattern? Do you see the pattern there? Out of Egypt, baptized. 40 days and then 12. That, you see the pattern there. Israel was taken out of Egypt, baptized into the Red Sea, and 40 years in the wilderness, and they became a kingdom with 12 nations. Jesus, out of Egypt, baptized 40 days in the wilderness and 12 disciples. Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. He is the object of the Father's affections. That's Jesus. He is the Israel of God. He is the new Israel, the true Israel. And guess what? You in Him, you are part of the covenant people of God. Even as He is chosen, you are chosen because you are in Him. Even as he is favored and blessed and love of God, you are favored, you are blessed, you are loved by God because you are in him. You are part of the one true Israel whose name is Yeshua. I believe that if you don't understand the principle of illusion, you cannot see that. You read Matthew chapter 2 and you would just, oh, uh, oh, the prophet said, out of Egypt I called my son. Oh, nice, wonderful, yeah, wow. There is a deeper, much richer meaning when you understand how the ancient rabbis and how the ancient teachers taught. Now, look at the, how Jesus quoted verses in Matthew chapter 24. Understand that whenever he quotes a verse, we are supposed to understand the verses before that and the verses after that because the meaning of what he's trying to say is in the alluded prophecy. The rule of the game is, if you don't know scriptures, you will never understand. When I say to somebody, hey, don't be a Romeo. If you don't understand Romeo and Juliet, you will never understand what I'm saying. That's how allusions work. There's so many verses actually he quotes in Matthew 24. For example, verse 29. Not many people understand that he was quoting a verse actually. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You know, you read this. A 21st century man reading this would think, Oh, wow. Wow, the moon will, will become dark. Oh, my. Oh, the stars will fall from heaven. Oh, he's talking about meteors. He's talking about comets. He's talking about, oh, my, you know. The solar system is going to be shaken. The sun will be darkened. Oh, that's dangerous. Wow. Hey, listen. Do you realize Jesus was quoting Isaiah chapter 13? He was quoting scriptures. And again, we need to go to the source to understand the meaning of his words. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Verse 10, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The 
It's Isaiah 13 verse 10. What was Isaiah talking about? Isaiah lived around 800 years before Jesus. He was a poet and he was writing a poem. It was a prophetic poem. And Jesus was quoting from the poem that Isaiah wrote. What was the poem all about? He was talking actually, Isaiah was actually talking about the fall of Babylon, which was, you know, Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire about 200 years after Isaiah's prophecy. Let's uh, read Isaiah 13 verse 1. A prophecy against Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. See, the day of Yahweh is coming, a cruel day with wrath and first fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Okay, <laughs> what was Isaiah talking about? He was talking about the fall of Babylon. During the time when Babylon fall, it, it seemed impossible. Babylon was the strongest, most powerful kingdom in the earth, among the nations of the earth. But Isaiah prophesied, Babylon, you will fall. Now, when Babylon was conquered by the Medes and the Persians, during uh, 500, 539 BC, did the sun become dark? Did the stars and the constellations fall? Did the moon stop shining? What happened? Was there a, a, a something that happened in the solar system? In the galaxy? No. Isaiah was a poet. And he was grasping for words to describe the tragedy, the downfall of the greatest city of the greatest kingdom in the world, Babylon. And the words he used to describe the fall of Babylon. He said, the moon will not give its light. The sun will be darkened. The stars in the heavens will fall. You know, sun, moon, stars in the ancient Middle Eastern world, that is very symbolic of leaders. You remember when Joseph had a dream? And he told his brothers and his father about his dream. He said, you know, last night I dreamt the sun and the moon and the stars, they bowed to me, to my star. And everybody was angry. His brother said, what? You think we will bow to you? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Immediately they understood. Oh, the sun is our father Jacob. The moon, that's your mother. Stars, that's us, your elder brothers. You see, in the ancient Middle Eastern uh, thinking, these leaders are symbolized by sun, moon, and stars. When Isaiah prophesied to Babylon, Babylon, you will fall. The sun will be darkened. It will uh, cease to give its light. The sun, stars in the heavens will fall. He was talking about the crumbling down and the fall of the dynasty of the kings of Babylon. You can actually see that also when 
Isaiah prophesied about the fall of Edom. In Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved. Oh, isipin mo yan? Ang mga stars sa heaven ma dissolve. And the heavens rolled up like a scroll. Ang kalangitan, parang scroll, parang papel na i-roll up. All the starry holes will fall like withered leaves. Lahat ng mga bituin will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. See, it descends in judgment on Edom, the people I have totally destroyed. You see, Edom helped Babylon when Babylon attacked Judea and destroyed the temple. The Edomites, these are the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. They're supposed to be relatives. But Edom helped the destruction of Jerusalem. And Isaiah prophesied. Now when he prophesied about the, the fall of Edom, he said, Lahat na mga bituin will dissolve. <laughs> the heavens will be rolled like scroll. <laughs> I mean, did... What, what happened? He was talking about the destruction of the Edomite. Uh, dynasty and also about the fall of Egypt conquered by the Babylonian Empire in 605 BC this is Ezekiel prophesying look what the prophet Ezekiel uh, wrote in chapter 32 verse 1 and 2 in the twelfth year in the twelfth month on the first day the word of the Lord came to me son of man take up a lament concerning Pharaoh king of Egypt and say to him you are like a lion among the nations. You are like a monster in the seas. See, Egypt was a very powerful nation. During the time of Ezekiel. And then look at what the Lord said to Egypt through the prophet Ezekiel in verse 7. When I snuff you out, I will cover the heavens and darken the stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. Now he talks again about the moon, the stars, and the sun. The darkening of the moon, the darkening of the sun, and the falling of the stars. What was Ezekiel talking about? He's talking about the downfall of the kingdom of Edom. Not about the heavenly bodies, but about the rulers the patriarchs, the kings of Edom, how they would fall. Verse 8 of Ezekiel 32, All the shining lights in the heavens, I will darken over you. I will bring darkness over your land. See, this is how the ancient prophets spoke. And then... Uh, Look at verse 11 to 12. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. The sword of the king of Babylon will come against you. I will cause your hordes to fall by the swords of mighty men. The most ruthless of all nations. They will shatter the pride of Egypt. And all her hordes will be overthrown. He's talking about the kingdom of Babylon conquering Edom. I mean uh, Egypt. That's in uh, 600 uh, B.C. And uh, describing that, he used the metaphor of the moon and the stars and the sun. Now, the thing is, this is, this is the problem with us modern readers. Because when the prophets talk about the moon and the stars and the sun, and we think, you know, one time here in Davao, the, what year was that? The city Facebook page posted some photos of the sun because early morning, and I saw it because early morning I would bring my kids to school around 
before 6.30 in the morning, and I saw in the sky, there's this very unusual cloud formation, you know, very thin, and it covered the sun. And because of the, uh, how thin the clouds were, around the sun, it's like there's a rainbow circling the sun. It, it's, it, it's refraction. It's, it's, you know, it's because of how the light was positioned. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I saw in the Facebook page of the city, people commenting on, that, on those photos. They were saying, this is the sign. Read Matthew 24. This is the sign that the Lord is about to come. The world is about to end. Repent! Repent! You know what? Christians become a laughing stock. And you know, some people from Jensen were making comments. They said, hey, we don't see that in Jensen. The sun is very hot here. <laughs> Because if it's raining here in Davao, in Jensen, it will be very hot. <laughs> you know what? When the prophet spoke of the moon becoming blood, for example, the prophet Joel spoke those words. Was he talking about the blood moon like John Hagee? He made millions when he wrote this book in uh, 2015, The Four Blood Moons. <laughs> because there was this unusual phenomenon. And there's even a, a news on CNN. Blood Moon has some expecting end of the world. That's in 2015. A lot of people. I know here in the Vow, many college students quit college because the Lord was going to come. 2000, we're, gonna, we're not going to reach 2016. The Lord's going to come in 2015 because the Pope was going to meet Obama. The Antichrist and the false prophet, they were going to come together and it fulfills Revelation 13. It's happening. Oh, come on, we're not reading the Bible properly. We don't understand what the prophets were talking about. We are misquoting scripture. And we become a laughing stock. And the integrity of scriptures. Brothers and sisters, many today have lost faith in the Bible. They think the Bible is just a bunch of myths and a bunch of stuff for fanatics. It's because of how we interpret scriptures i pray that we will understand scriptures as they are and we will appreciate the bible and we will fully see the meaning of what the prophets were actually talking about now i'm going to close with this okay this is i want to quote the you know quote the scripture because this is similar to what Jesus said in Matthew 24. These are, these are actually related. Acts chapter 2. This was when the Holy Spirit came 50 days after the, the resurre uh, resurrection of, of Jesus. The, the Holy Spirit came upon the followers of Jesus in the upper room. 120 followers, believers were there and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And Peter, he preached because... The people in Jerusalem, it so happened, it was the time of the feast and, and, and uh, Jews from all over the world were gathering in Jerusalem and the disciples were speaking in tongues and they were amazed. They thought these guys are drunk early in the morning and so P Peter stood up, he said, men of Jerusalem, Jews from all over the world, these men are not drunk. It's still 9 o'clock in the morning. And he, 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 Peter, when he preached, he quoted from Joel chapter 2. Again, allusion. We need to understand what Joel was talking about because when Peter took some verses from Joel, he was actually talking about the message of the prophet Joel. 
these ancient rabbis, they never quote scripture out of context. When they quote some verses, they're talking about the whole, the verses before and the verses after. For us to understand what Peter was talking about, we need to go back to the message of the prophet Joel. Because Peter was actually saying, what the prophet Joel has been speaking about, it is now being fulfilled right before your very eyes. It's happening. This is now the time of fulfillment. Let me read to you verse 16. This is Peter quoting the prophet Joel. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, we read this and we try to come up with meanings by what we read. Not even bothering to read Joel. We miss the point. Because the whole point is what Joel was saying. What was Joel saying? We need to understand you go, you go to the book of Joel. Now, I'm not going to read all of the book of, 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 of the chapters of Joel. Even though it's a short book, you read it. That's your assignment. Look at the... I'm just going to pick some verses for you to get the meaning here. Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. For a nation has come up against my land. He is talking about an invasion. Jerusalem will be invaded by a foreign army. That was the message of Joel. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth and its fangs are of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. It's talking about a foreign nation destroying God's vineyard, Jerusalem, Judea. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion. He's talking about an alarm, a warning. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble for the day of Yahweh. The day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes. Such as never was in ancient times. Nor will ever be in ages to come. Joel was prophesying about a large and mighty army attacking the city of Jerusalem. This is the message of Peter. He said in the last days. What last days was Peter talking about? It is the last days of the old covenant. Because Peter lived in a time when he spoke this about 40 years later, the armies of Rome marched against Jerusalem and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. That's why the prophecy was twofold. There's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Many shall call on the name of the Lord and be saved. But then also, the prophecy included blood and fire and billows of smoke. The moon will be turned to blood. The sun will be darkened. See, it happened 40 years later. Jerusalem was destroyed. There was blood. 
there was smoke. There was fire. There was destruction. Why? Because those were the last days of the temple age. Those were the last days of the old covenant. The old covenant was closing. AD 70, when finally Rome conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. That was the final closing of the old covenant. The Levitical priests, it was gone. The temple, it was gone. Why? There is a new priesthood. There is a new temple. There is a new sacrifice. There is a new covenant. Hallelujah. So I pray we will understand this properly because if we don't, like C.S. Lewis, he was so disappointed. One of the most brilliant men in history. One of the most brilliant Christians in history. He was reading the Bible. He was reading Matthew 24 and he was reading Matthew 16 and he was saying, Jesus failed to do what he said. He did not come. He did not understand how Jesus was using illusion. He was quoting Daniel 7 and he was quoting Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34. And it's beautiful. I pray we will understand how beautiful the scriptures are. I pray we will understand how beautiful the teachings of Jesus are. How meaningful, how deep, how rich. And I pray we will read the Bible with open eyes and open hearts. And we will see the beauty and the grandeur of our Lord. Hallelujah. When he quoted Isaiah's poem about the destruction of Babylon and applied it to Jerusalem, he was saying actually, Jerusalem has become Babylon. The religious Jews were oppressing the believers of grace, the believers of the new covenant. The religious ones were oppressing. And the Lord was saying, your sun will be darkened. Your moon will not give its light. Your stars are going to fall. He was talking about the liberation of his people. He was talking about his vindication as king. About the freedom of his people. He's not trying to scare us like, Ay, naku ang sun, mamatay na yung sun. Paano na lang, mawala na ang earth. Naku, sana tayo, punta na tayo sa planet Mars. <laughs> <laughs> That's so science fiction. <laughs> hey, anyway, thank you so much uh, for joining, guys. I would love to read your comments, but before that, can I pray for you? Abba, Father, thank you for my brothers and my sisters tonight. I pray, Abba, that in these challenging times, you will awaken each one to how close you really are, that we are no longer in the old we are in the new. That in this new covenant, you are the Israel of God. You are the faithful one, the perfect one. You, in covenant with God, in perfect union. You, the deserving one. You, the blessed one. You, the exalted one. And Abba, Father, make us see how we have become one with Jesus how we are in Jesus, that His place is our place, His exaltation is our exaltation, His authority is our authority, and His blessing is our blessing, that we are loved by You, Father, in Christ, as loved as He is, so are we. In Christ, as close as He is to the Father, that is how close we are. In Christ, as blessed as Jesus is, that is how blessed each and every one really, truly, truly is. Abba, let our worries and anxious thoughts 
be replaced with beautiful thoughts and the realization of how loved we are. Thank you, precious Father. In the most precious, most beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Be a partner to this ministry, okay? We could use a lot of help. We are constructing our uh, center. It's a training center. It's a retreat center. As soon as, uh, uh, you know, we can gather, we will gather. And uh, we will do some retreats and seminars and conferences in Kalayaan. And you can be of a great help. No matter how small, no matter how big, what matters is your faith. Listen to the Lord, how the Lord will lead you. And it will always be amazing. You have our BPI account there, and you have our GCash, and you have our PayPal. So let's do this together, okay?